everybody. Welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 102. I'm Steve Kwan. And I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. Today, we have a returning champion, actually from not that long ago, really. <laughs> Lachlan Giles, all the way from Australia, back to talk to us once again. How are you guys? Yeah, good to have you, Lachlan. Thanks for coming. How are you doing, Lachlan? Yeah, I'm doing well, thank you. Hey, and I hear you're free. I hear you're back on the mats. Yeah, so as the rest of the world is uh, <laughs> closing down, we're, we're back. Yeah, we're, um, we've had 35 days of zero cases now, so we're... Um, Jeez. Yeah, so it's full steam ahead. Sounds like paradise. So, yeah, it's very good. Things are unfortunately kind of taking the opposite direction here. It was funny. Matt and I, um, we had a podcast in the queue that we were recording and Matt was talking about how, oh, right now, you know, like gyms are open here in Vancouver. We only recorded that like a few weeks ago and nope, now, now they're all closed. I mean, things just turned on a dime so quickly Yeah. and who knows how long that's going to be for. So man, I, yeah. I'm glad that you guys were able to get the thing under control. It's, it's, I'm kind of looking at you guys and I'm hoping that, man, like, I hope that can be us in about a month or so. I really hope so. Cause it wouldn't be nice to kind of get back to normal. It took us like, well, I mean, it was eight months really of being shut, but um, so I hope it doesn't take <laughs> that long for you guys. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, today on a completely different note, but one that I think will be just as much fun to talk about, something that we wanted to talk about, which is both timely, topical, and I, I think a conversation that I know Matt and I have really wanted to have for a long time as well. We wanted to talk about the juice, the bomba performance enhancing drugs and particularly the ethics surrounding them. Now, I don't know about you guys. I, I know Lachlan, you actually are educated, but Matt and I are just dumbasses. We're not scientists. I pretend to be educated <laughs> on topics. I have no business being educated. in. I'll start out saying I, I know very little about the science behind them. And, um, and even, you know, like I, I've, I've barely looked into any research behind any of the side effects and, and so on. I'm aware that, you know, there are, certainly um negative health implications of taking but I, I like i mean i'm an expert in physiotherapy but i'm not yeah um i'm not an expert in um but as gordon says you got bronze at 80 cc so you had to have been juicing <laughs> of course yeah, that's, that's, that's his uh his yeah opinion, so I, I guess that's yeah. kind of what kicked off this whole episode is you posted what i thought was ultimately a a pretty innocuous statement on instagram and and something that like you mentioned in in any other sport it would be kind of par for the course but jiu-jitsu is still in its infancy in terms of its development as a sport. And I, I think we all know that the, the attitudes surrounding PEDs are a lot more casual in the jiu-jitsu community than they would be in really any other sport, even MMA, for example, which has come a long way in a, in a relatively short period of time. So why don't you talk maybe a little bit about what your stance is and kind of the conversation that you've been having that led to this, this podcast episode here with us? Yeah, so I mean... Yeah, I suppose. I mean, the post I, I made was something along the effects of taking performance enhancing drugs is is cheating. And I think if you if you did take performance enhancing drugs while you were you know in, in the lead up or while you were competing, then I don't really think you deserve those accomplishments, whatever you whatever accomplishments you made while you were on those performance enhancing drugs, because because I think it's cheating. So yeah, that was my stance, which, as you said, is basically the stance every sport and everyone seems to have for every other sport in the world maybe except for some forms of bodybuilding or something i think they might have slightly different approach but of course people you know i'm not not obviously people in every sport there's people that are going to try to cheat but the way they're viewed in those sports for example if they're caught caught to be cheating or yeah especially if they're caught to be to be cheating is it, you know they they're really um looked down upon whereas I, I just don't really see that happening too much in, in jiu-jitsu so i think it's something that needs to change mm -hmm. and i'll just give my opinion on it and my as with many of my views they've changed over time and are very subject to change again uh, i used to actually think the exact same way i used to be full on like you know if you're if you're taking juice and you're cheating and and it is it is cheating i think there's a various degrees of using it to cheat if there's any way to say that like uh i think if someone has like low testosterone levels you know which actually you know i i know people that actually have that that have never taken steroids in their life it is a real condition yeah and if you have low levels for me it makes sense to to make sure that you're all topped up and you can perform at a higher level 
uh, because it is a real thing. And I used to I used to think, you know, straight up, if you take it, it's cheating and it's wrong and it's immoral and all this stuff. I've almost I've almost turned a corner on it. And I I don't use PEDs. You know, I, n- I never have. I, I'm not going to say I never will. But as the years go on and I'm sort of, you know, entering my mid 30s, I'm kind of exiting my prime or, you know, I'm in my prime right now. And just training every day is it has like a lot of, as you know, wear and tear on your body. And uh, I realize like, you know, I've kind of committed to doing this for my whole life now. And every day you go in, sometimes you go in with your guys and, and at the end of practice, you're just glad you didn't get injured. And I'm just I've kind of turned a corner. I can I can sympathize a little bit more with people who maybe use small levels for recovery. Are you talking about while competing here or just to to train, you know, like as a as a hobby? I mean, it's kind of an interesting question talking about competing considering the current climate with COVID and everything. You know, competing's yeah. been pretty far off most people's minds unless you're a really high-level competitor. There's just not many competitions unless you're willing to travel. I do think that if you are getting ready for a big tournament and then you go in there and you're juiced to the gills, you know, I mean, it's hard to not look at that any other way than cheating. But on the same token, it is jujitsu. And there are tournaments that, I mean, they're not, they're not not telling you to do it. You know what I mean? So it's, you could look at it as leveling the playing field. There's kind of an unwritten rule of like, okay, you shouldn't be doing this. It's, you know, it's kind of frowned upon, but at the same time, you know, most of these guys are doing it, uh, especially if you look at like ADCCs. I think the I think the majority of, of people are on something or they're getting some form of help. And even IBJJF, even though they've sort of in the last decade, they've t- turned over a new leaf of, OK, we're going to go legit and we're, go- you know, it's going to be a real sport. There's going to be drug testing. But we all know that most of those guys are also cheating as well so i've i've sort of you know just as someone who does martial arts every day and and i know you do too um you understand how hard it is on the body as i'm getting older i'm wondering like am i going to continue to be able to do this at a pace without getting some help like is my body going to be able to do that and i think there's also a difference if you're competing there's a difference between competing at worlds or pans or adccs or one of the premier events And then competing in like Masters 3, Masters 4, you know, because like I do want to compete, you know, into my 40s, into my 50s if my body will allow me to. So I'm not really trying to win like the highest levels, I guess. But Matt, I do get a kick out of how in the relatively short period of time that we've been doing this podcast, just a few years, like you have so clearly aged like I I remember the beginning you're like PEDs no man but now just a few years later you're like I I get kind of get it my body's falling apart everything is just collapsing I'm getting thicker in places that I don't want to get thicker like it we're not thick enough I mean it's I mean I I think um if I can put my perspective on that I think from from my perspective it's like if you're I mean fair enough if you're not competing especially i mean especially at a high level maybe maybe in a local tournament people you know like whatever but um no one puts as much uh it's it's not like it's someone's career on the line or or whatever in something like that then but like if someone wants to do it and they just want to train and so on then absolutely um i think i think it's it comes down to me to the the idea that everyone's on it that i think that's the reason why people justify that like, oh, everyone's on it so therefore it's not cheating which i just don't agree with that at all I, I mean i know for a fact not everyone's on it in the end like can you take people's word for it i don't know i mean like how do you it's kind of hard to prove a negative right so like people are just guessing mm-hmm. about who is and who isn't well i know you're on it because i saw that picture before <laughs> and after <laughs> yeah that's one right. was in a baggy t-shirt next to marcello and the other one was up close in a tight rash guard like 10 uh, years after, later after, a, <laughs> after, after a match when i've got like <laughs> blood flowing to my muscles compared to um standing there in a t-shirt after cutting weight for worlds yeah, yeah. <laughs> when i want to know who's on the juice and who's not gordon ryan is my go-to guy no i mean for, for me I've, I've i've obviously competed against a bunch of high level guys even like in my weight division i've competed against i'm not, I'm not gonna like say any specific names in this podcast because i think even just speculating about a particular person people start you know uh, as as you've already seen from my post people start going on these these rants so but i think like i mean i've competed against some of the best guys in my division and nothing to me in those matches said that they were like insanely strong or um mm. 
or anything that was like extremely physical. I mean, my opinion is the real advantage that someone would get from it would be the training load anyway. Mm -hmm. Like you can now train and recover so much faster. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you get these people who are training three, four times a day or, you know, six hours a day or five hours a day, even four. Like that's a that's a lot more skill development you can possibly build up. So that's an interesting thing. I remember a while ago, I was listening to a podcast, uh, an MMA podcast, and they were they were showing testimony from an MMA guy who had previously taken steroids, and he was talking about the experience. And he said it was weird because when you're training on steroids, his his experience was his mind was tired, but his body wasn't. Yeah. Like he could have just kept going, right? And not having to worry about recovery is is such a competitive advantage. And I can see how that can be seductive. I mean, my personal belief on the matter, I mean, I I think everyone knows I'm a hobbyist black belt. Like the only sauce I'm on is barbecue sauce, basically. (laughs) Um, I have no experience with steroids or competing or any of this. And so if you were to put a gun to my head, I mean, my out of the box answer is obviously going to be, they should be illegal. Absolutely. But if I try to put my feet in the shoes of someone who does this for a living, I can understand where it comes from. I suspect a lot of these guys, it probably doesn't start with them just like deliberately thinking I'm going to get on the juice and I'm going to be the biggest and strongest. I'm going to crush people. I know a lot of the time it's a recovery thing, right? It's you've got a big tournament coming up. It's critical to your success. And then you suffer an injury. And what do you do, right? I mean, you see that, you see those drugs, those illegal drugs as maybe the path to keep on the rails. And I have to look at it from the perspective of, you know, someone in my own field. I mean, I, I'm not aware of any such thing, but if I suffered some sort of setback and I stood to lose my job unless I took an illegal substance, I, I have to admit that even knowing it was wrong, I can see the pressure. And I can also understand how if you believe everyone else is doing it, it also kind of is a way for you to give yourself permission to break the rules and not feel so bad about it. So I think Lachlan, you're, you're very right there that when people say, ah, oh, everyone's doing it. Well, that's a very defeatist attitude. Well, I mean, and it's, and it's wrong too. The fact is not everyone's on it. And therefore you're giving yourself an edge that other people don't have. That's illegal. And people are doing, you know, like if we think about, let's, let's say, you know, cause a lot of people say, why don't we just legalize it and everyone can take it. But so you're now asking people to risk their health beyond the, you know, obviously you're already competing in a jiu-jitsu tournament. There's a lot of things you're doing that are already risking your health. You're now asking people that, let, let's assume that it does give you a considerable competitive advantage here. Then you're asking people to risk their own health, you know, more more chance of, of heart disease and so on. I said, I'm not like extremely well read on that. So I, I could even be off with that, but like risking your health, just to be able to compete at a level, which is not true because I know you can, I'm, I know you can compete at that level regardless, but it's, I think it would be silly to not think it gives you an advantage. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty clear that it it does, right? If nothing else in terms of recovery, and when you're talking about a career like athletics, when you have to basically win all of your, your medals within like a 10, 15 year time frame, you know, recovery is probably more important than any strength advantage you're actually going to get, right? I mean, I would love to train five hours a day. Yeah, it's like, skill and, development. And train, you know, as I get older, my training volume decreases and my training intensity decreases as well. And I think that's actually... Mm-hmm. The intensity is probably the the thing. You see these young guys who are going like crazy, you know, like they're, they're sparring like at a high pace, but that's actually, that's the pace of a match. So they're getting like their timing and everything for match pace is right on point. And as you get older, you have to go, okay, well, I'm going to go slower just because it's, you know, healthier for my body, but you actually lose a little bit of the timing and so on as well. And I think that's, yeah, so that, that's obviously a, a big issue there. Like when, when, when someone when someone now can take drugs and, and keep a higher pace going in their training and mm. and so on, that's, that's a, a big advantage they're giving themselves. Rolling in your 20s is so different from rolling in your 30s, I'm noticing. Like after I turned 30, I noticed things started giving out and I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to make huge adjustments to my style you know, to, to how I train, how I recover, Mm. the intensity changes. I remember last time you said, you know, during the evening, when you go to classes, a lot of the time you just sort of, you observe more than you actually get the training in. That's kind of like you do your pro training mostly during the day. And then in the evening, you know, you're observing and you're helping your guys. And I'm, you know, if you're a full-time martial artist and uh, if you're a gym owner and instructor, that's what you do for a living. I realize like, it's hard to 
especially if you're doing multiple sessions, putting in, you know, as hard as you can, you can't do it every day unless, unless you have the assist of some kind of performance enhancing drug, which sounds really awesome. I wish I could do that because I just, I just want to roll like I was a purple belt forever. You know, I look back at some of my purple belt matches now and I'm like, God, I was fucking like spazzy. I didn't really know what I was doing a lot of the time. It was just a lot of tenacity went a long way. And now I'm looking at it and I'm like, if I roll like that now, my chance of injury is real high. Uh, it's it's not so much I find how, you know, how ferocious you can be. As it's more about the, your knowledge and your strategy and whatnot. But I imagine when you're going against guys, when you're going into like an ADCC or ADCC trials, I mean... I think you're right. Not everyone is on it. I think it is wrong to sort of say, okay, it's it's okay now. So you're kind of expected to do it. I think that that is also not really a good practice. But I think we can agree that a lot of guys are on it. And especially in jujitsu, it's so it's so prevalent in the culture. It's like it's almost encouraged in some cultures of jujitsu. Yeah, I mean, that, for, that's the, certainly what I've heard. I mean, I think I, my personal opinion is you should presume everyone to be innocent until they're caught. And we should do a lot of testing and do what we can to try to catch people. And obviously, if they're caught, then I think that should be quite harsh punishments mm-hmm. for that. But until then, I think it needs to be presumed that, that people are innocent. And, and it needs to, yeah, I just think it needs to, the attitude needs to change the, the idea that everyone's on it. And that it's not, you know, th- that's kind of why I worded it, my post that way. Because I, mm. I think people who are using it, they don't think they're cheating. They think they're just like, oh, everyone's on it. so. Well, actually, it is cheating, and there are people who are not on it, and you're giving yourself an advantage over them. Maybe, maybe let's even pretend, like let's say half or three quarters of your division is on it, but that's still a quarter of the division, or even maybe it's even maybe there's one guy in the division mm-hmm. that's not on it. Let's just assume the worst there. Well, the worst would be everyone, but <laughs> um, you know, even if there's one guy in your division that's not on it, you're still giving yourself an advantage over that. Like you're not. It's not a level playing field. You need to. I think we have to aim for that. And of course, it's very unfair then if you're not on it and other people are. That's that's extremely unfair. Um, and that's why we need the testing. The alternative is that they, they you know, let's say it's legalized. Everyone can take it. Then it's it probably then I imagine becomes like, well, how much, you know, if I take X amount, I'm going to get this much out of it, but it risks, you know, my body more, but it's worth mm-hmm. it for the comp. You know, like you kind of would... Start pushing it into very unhealthy territory, yeah. Just for that extra little bit of advantage, and I can't see that being good either. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I think like I mean, every other sport in the world has had the same dilemma, and they've come to the conclusion that te- regular testing and banning performance enhancing drugs is 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 the right answer. There are people who have thought about it a lot more than you and I, and and uh, you know the ethics of it and so on. So. I, I think we probably should go through some of the people's um, critiques to that idea as well, just to kind of flesh them out. Yeah, yeah, just to flesh the argument out. I mean, if we're going to be a totally objective party here, right, if we were to just strip away all of the specific use cases and just look at what some of these drugs are, I mean, there's no denying that they are incredible medicine, right? There's a reason why steroids are prescribed for so many different medical conditions. They're, they're actually just an incredible medicine that we have at our disposal. And there are definitely situations where under doctor's orders, they could be the best thing that you could possibly do. But if you want an example of what can happen when you kind of just run the train off the rails, right? Because you're right, like a lot of people basically say like, look, don't we want to see the the maximum performance that a human can achieve? Just, you know, let them do whatever they want. Let's see what the, let's see what it really looks like when people are at peak levels. You can do that. But then you like you mentioned earlier, Lachlan, you kind of get a bit of a race to the bottom, I think, where it creates pressure on everybody else to match what the others are doing. And before you know it, everyone is just juiced to the gills, right? I mean, probably the most obvious example is the like professional wrestling back in the 80s and 90s, where they really turned a blind eye to this. And then at some point after public scrutiny, they kind of put in place a a policy to catch this stuff, but it wasn't really serious. And yeah, they were having problems where people were dropping dead of heart attacks in their 30s, right? Otherwise healthy people with massively enlarged heart Parts from just systematic abuse of these drugs. So on the other hand, though, I mean, there's something to be said about it, right? Like if you are an athlete and you blow out your knee or something and under doctor's orders, they can work with you to use steroids to get you back on the mat sooner rather than later. 
maybe that's a situation where it's not so bad. I don't know. I, I, medical, medically prescribed, it's, a, it's an interesting one, but I mean, my thoughts are like, I mean, I can't think of an injury you can't rehab without the use of steroids. So It's basically time, right? Yeah. It all comes down to time. I think the most important thing is that if they're ever going to be used in a way that is approved, it really has to be under doctor supervision and for specific purposes, right? I think that you get into risky territory when you start trying to to juice up to the gills without any supervision, because then the only person really holding you accountable is, you know, the people around you. And when you look at them and it becomes a race to see who can get bigger or stronger, it can get out of control quite quickly. But you mentioned talking about some of the counterpoints. I mean, I guess one of the counterpoints is I have heard people who have basically said, if we want to see the the maximum human potential, like let's just take the cap off of this thing and let's just let athletes do what they want. I mean, I'm not a fan of that opinion, but I'd be curious to know how do you counter that when people basically say like, look, they're athletes, they're grown adults. Let's see what everyone can do if we just level the playing field. But in this case, by level the playing field, they mean no rules, right? How do you how do you answer that? Well, it kind of doesn't level the playing field because I feel like then there's there's people, you know, like I myself wouldn't want to take them because of the because of the health. So, like, let's say it was legal. I, my main reason I'm, I don't actually two, two main reasons that I don't. One is health, and one is I think it's cheating. So, like both of those. So, if you took away the cheating part, I still wouldn't because you know I don't want to die when I'm fifty or sixty. I want to have a healthy heart, like you know, all all that sort of stuff. Maybe maybe I don't. Maybe I'm not educated enough about it. And there's maybe there is ways you can do it that's still you know doesn't affect your health but uh, apart from that it's cheating so obviously if you took away the cheaper and which to be fair like um which is another argument there's you know like adcc i don't believe has anything written about um, performance enhancing drugs so technically in adcc it's not but then you've got athletes who are competing ibjjf and adcc so i still think it's cheating in that if you're fighting someone who's wanting to compete in both but you just want to compete ADCC, then you could potentially have an advantage over them, an unfair advantage, which is the the performance enhancing drugs. So, even though it's technically not in in that rule set, I still think it is. If if other people are following one code and you're following one that allows you to have a big advantage over them, Mor- morally, not technically cheating, then I guess. But yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, the just the inconsistency in the rule sets is kind of like a just sort of through arbitrage is something that I guess people can exploit, right? In the example that you're talking about, where if you can find the one place where this kind of stuff is actually okay, then you immediately have an advantage of people who are held accountable to other rule sets elsewhere. I guess another thing that I know people bring up when it comes to steroids, if they want to argue in favor of it, is the recovery argument, right? Where they basically say, you know, kind of like I mentioned earlier, look, if you want to be an athlete, you've got, you know, a decade plus maybe to really make your mark. And people get bad injuries through no faults of their own. And maybe performance enhancing drugs can shorten that recovery time. I'd be curious to, and I know that a lot of people, you know, when they get busted, that's often their excuse is, oh, well, you know, I wasn't using it because I wanted to cheat. I just got desperate because I I needed to recover faster from an injury. Common excuse. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that and your response to that as well, because I know that that's one that sometimes people bring up. I'm not aware of any research findings suggesting recovery is faster with steroids but perhaps there there is it's, it's i don't think it's to be honest i don't think it's something that people like i'm talking about like injury recovery i'm not sure it's something that people actually research because it I suppose because they're illegal to begin with i i think that's probably a good point is it might be an assumption that it actually helps you recover faster in fact if anyone who's listening has a background in this kind of stuff i would love to know um you know is there actually any basis for this or is this actually just like folk knowledge that isn't true at all because I I think to your point because um, just because of the fact that they are illegal the amount of information that we have about how they work in these contexts is actually probably quite limited I mean I can see like let's say you you tore your ACL one of the biggest factors is you know regaining your muscle strength and size so I mean I can I could see how obviously if you're taking performance enhancing drugs that will get you that back quicker maybe that will make your recovery faster like logically that probably does make sense Um, i'm not aware of any one doing a research project i think it would be hard to get that through ethics where you you know tell people to take a legal (laughs) imagine supplements to um you know like randomized into um illegal versus placebo illegal supplements i think you'd you'd struggle to um get that through an ethics committee but uh, maybe it's been done i'm not sure but yeah i mean logically to me that would make sense for that but um 
But I, I think to your point, you're probably right that a good portion of it is tribal folk knowledge, right? Where maybe people are doing it because they think it's the solution to their problem, but it might actually not be. And the, you know, the, the lack of, of knowledge around how this stuff works is, you know, that's actually something that I know that a lot of other people for when it comes to illegal substances, people a lot of the time will argue that actually these things are tremendously beneficial, but we simply don't have the research to prove it because they are illegal. It could be right too. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's a, maybe it's, there's ways that it's healthier. I, I don't really know that, but, um, I'd certainly want that to be very clearly <laughs> researched before before it was something that they they recommended. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, in terms of like, if you get an injury, I mean, I don't know. I've had I've had two knee surgeries before. That's a, like basically two years off due to to rehab. Like everyone, every every athlete has the potential to go through that. So I think again, trying to take a shortcut that you know gives you an advantage over someone else is is um it's not the right way to do it. So I'd, I'd actually be curious to know, kind of last thing, and I think this ties into something that Matt mentioned earlier. What are your thoughts on the, I guess you could call it the Vitor Belfort excuse, where it's like, look, I'm old. <laughs> you know, I want to be young again. <laughs> and I, from a, a personal level, I can totally understand that. But from a competition level, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Because a lot of the time people will use these things in an attempt to neutralize aging itself. Yeah, I mean... Again, if if someone just wants to do that and they don't want to com- compete, especially at a high level, then so be it. Uh, I just I think um, yeah, I, I don't think it's right. I mean, I just think you you know you get old. That's it. You you get past your competitive prime. <laughs> that's how I see it. It's a sad thing <laughs> when you get past your competitive prime. Stop trying to compete against the best guys. That's that's my personal opinion. I can see the let's say a, B- a Vitor Belfort like where he's making good money to continue to be able to fight at that level. Then it's actually like he's got a lot of incentive to to do that but in the end it's you know it's legislated that it's cheating so yeah and i think that's a kind of a good example too of where i understand the appeal to want to live your life like you're 20 when you're actually 40 or 50 right i i understand the appeal of wanting to live the glory days forever but you know there comes a time in everyone's life where you have to move on to the next phase of what you can contribute right and you see this in all walks of life, but in jujitsu, you know, part of the life cycle is around the time you get past your competitive years, you got to start thinking about, you know, how do you give back to the sport? How do you build a business that will take care of you and your family? How do you raise the next generation of grapplers, right? And if you kind of insist on sort of artificially pumping yourself so you can stay competitive with the young guys, I mean, I think at the end of the day, maybe you'd be better off at the end of the day if you actually stepped out of that arena and into the the next one that's age appropriate. But moreover, I mean, again, lacking evidence, I can't imagine it's good for 40 and 50 year olds to get yeah. juiced up and then go and get head kicked and knocked out, right? Like there's, you know, or even in the case of grappling, like there is a limit to how much and how long you can artificially inflate the balloon before it pops. And I, I think that that's something that, yeah, you know, the problem is a lot of the time you don't see that damage because it's internal, but I think the, the, the added training volume, I think there's certain parts of your body, which are highly vascularized, like you know, muscle and and soft tissue often is, which is usually what makes you feel sore, which because it's highly vascularized, it tends to have a high turnover rate and you can recover that quite quickly. But I wonder if the joint loading and so on is going to respond the same way to those drugs. Like I I get the feeling that people who are overtraining feel good because their muscles and tendons are kind of recovering, but I don't know that their joints will be coping with the load so well. and, And that could be yeah, which is it tends to be a lot slower to react to changes in in load and intensity or just high intensity training and I, and I think people might be doing themselves a lot more long term damage than they think going at that sort of pace beyond what their their body can do exactly i kind of feel like maybe people are sort of holding their body together with duct tape when really it's time to hang them up yeah and the parts that they're paying attention to they might be able to kind of keep working but there's other factors that you don't consider right i mean i know for example in the case of a striking art like don't even get into brain damage, right? And concussive force, right? There's no amount of steroids you can take as far as we know that is going to repair, you know, your brain if you've been concussed over and over and over again. And you might feel fine until you don't, right? And I I do kind of wonder if it's better to sort of age out gracefully (laughs) than it is to to try to artificially inflate yourself and hang with the young guys. Yeah, I suppose that's something that 
as I, I don't really know the you know like maybe maybe if your testosterone is going low maybe there are some benefits of of taking that you know to to get you back to what would cons- be considered a normal level but I still I think at the moment at least that's illegal so that's how it is it's cheating <laughs> don't yeah. compete if you if you're doing it that's that's my opinion at least don't compete at a at a level that people you know are trying to really you know that, that people are taking it seriously and and trying to you know put their career into that that's that's my thoughts I got a question for you Lachlan yeah do you ever see um like a time in in the future of your career where maybe you will justify it to yourself and be like you know what I think I'm gonna get some help maybe you're in your late 40s or maybe you go through like a really traumatic injury you need surgery or something and and uh, you want to recover I, th- I, th- I think if I'm not I put it this way if I'm not competing and I felt like I can't ro- like you know if I was like I'm not competing I really like jiu-jitsu and I actually, I'm struggling to train <laughs> and there was some good scientific research saying that this is not going to be a bad thing. I don't have an issue with people doing that. So I, I mean, it's, it's a possibility in a scenario like that, mm-hmm. but certainly not as a, as a competitor. Do you think that let's say you had, you know, let's say you tear your ACL or you, you get like a, a really bad injury that's got like a year timeline recovery but there's an ADCC within that timeline and you think maybe if you could uh, get some help that it could get you back into the back into position to be ready in time for the tournament. But you would only take it to I don't know, like you're like you're not going to go into your camp doing it. You're just going to do it to sort of speed up the recovery. And then, as you know, let's just say you. You don't need it during your camp. Would you can still still consider that cheating, even though you're not doing your maybe three months out preparation or four months out preparation for ADCC, and then you go in and you're not juiced at all? Is that something that you would justify in your head, or would you just say, "I'm just not going to compete this time"? I would not compete. I mean, I, I still see that as cheating because I think any gain, like you know, let's say you, let's say I can't do any jujitsu, I've injured my knee, so I'm just going to do strength training. Like I can still do like some sort of some sort of exercise that way then like there's long lasting benefits to strength training it's like you could go off you could put someone on performance enhancing drugs get them to do strength training they go off them but they can maintain that for especially if they keep some sort of strength regimen going they could keep those gains for a very long time so now i don't think it's just like you go off and then it's like a switch that turns off i think once you've used it it's it's kind of like that's why i i even think it's some of the people who've been busted for it and it might have been five years ago. Like, how do you undo? How do you undo the the five years of training that they did at a higher load and all the skill development that they got from that? That was an unfair advantage. How do you, like, even when they go off it, you can't take away their skill they developed from from all that training load. So it's it's an interesting discussion there. I don't. I, don't, I mean, obviously, I, I guess you just go off the the guidelines that the anti doping bodies. Um, provide but i still don't know if that takes away the advantage that they've gained especially in something like jiu-jitsu which i think the pr- the primary determinant is is going to be skill and you can't just take that like you know you can't give them two years ban and that goes away well interestingly lachlan i was reading a while ago there was a study that was done quite recently i i wish i could maybe i'll link it in the in the show notes to the article if i can find it but there was a study that they did recently on this topic and they did find that when people take performance enhancing drugs like steroids, if they go off of them, there is a long-term residual benefit. Even if you are off of them for so long that you lose all of that muscle mass, your body retains the ability to remember how to kind of be that big and you can get the mass back and get the strength back more quickly than if you'd never been on the drugs at all. Yeah, I've heard that. I haven't read that study, but I have heard of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's plausible, right? Like, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I think the big thing is when it comes to competition, I think it is fair to set very strict, very conservative rules, even if on their surface, it's questionable whether they make sense or not, because you want to preserve the most level playing field possible. I mean, heck, like marijuana is still illegal in a lot of sports, right? And I guess the question is, when it comes to drugs, I'm not sure if the drug itself should be innocent until proven guilty, right? I think you kind of have to assume that the drug is maybe, it should have to be proven that a drug is harmless before you start allowing athletes to take it rather than the other way around, right? Like there there should be a very, very high bar to clear if you want to allow the use of drugs by competitive athletes. I I think so, at least for a certain classes of drugs. You know, like if you know it's a form of hormone, for example, then 
you're going to want to probably ban that until proven otherwise. Maybe like a, I don't know, some sort of painkiller or something. I, I'm not sure we have to have the same standards as, as that. But, um, you know, obviously, or like an antibiotic. I don't think we have to prove that an antibiotic doesn't make you stronger before we ban that antibiotic. Because like, antibiotics aren't classically thought to make you stronger. Like that's not a, a thing that tends to happen. But some some sort of hormone, obviously, we we know, you know, that they tend to have greater effects in that. So those sort of things, I think, probably need more. So I think you can be selective to some degree. But again, you'd probably want a, an endocrinologist to to be talking about that more than me. <laughs> Actually, can I bring up because one other thing which uh, argument I've heard is is kind of like that it's a bit arbitrary that people say you know like why PEDs but people are allowed to do other things and have unfair advantages and you know you're like you're allowed to you're allowed to have a better coach than someone else you can you know you're born in a city where there's better jiu jitsu that you can you know diet and all these other things and of course there are a lot of variables but all of those ones i think don't requ- like my opinion is the performance enhancing drugs one it it comes down to it becomes unhealthy like you're asking someone to do something unhealthy beyond what's like required in the sport obviously like training you could say potentially is unhealthy if you kind of overdo it as well but you're kind of asking someone to do something with it that's not related to the skill of the actual sport to where they have to do something that's actually unhealthy for their body in order to try and improve their chances of winning and i don't think we should be asking our athletes to do that and i you know it worries me that there's these young upcoming athletes that are going to think that that's what they have to do now that's that's a concern, you know. I think that's a great line to draw in terms of what's okay and what's not, because I've heard those arguments too. I've heard people say, for example, well, what if you get like LASIK surgery? Or what if you are in a striking art and you get scar tissue removed surgically, right? Which is going to reduce the likelihood of you getting cuts, for example, in the future. Isn't that cheating as well? And I think that your answer there is the right answer, which is like, look, some of these things are are good for you. Some of these things are bad for you. And really, I think that if you are creating a pressure for athletes to do things that are detrimental to their own health, just to stay competitive, um, like performance enhancing drugs, that's where I think you need to start really thinking about regulation and drawing the line, right? I mean, that's right. taking, yeah. for example, protein supplements is not going to kill you or be harmful, right? And unless you do something absolutely insane. But if you want to start taking things that, to the best of our knowledge, do have detrimental effects, right? I think the burden of proof should be on the, on the drug itself. And we should have to prove it safe before we start allowing it at the high levels just to to try to keep things clear. And and you're right that sometimes the bar can be confusing. I mean, maybe there are times where it's easy to say, well, why is this legal and not that? But yeah, that's at right. the end of the day, you have to have a bar <laughs> and you have to try to make that bar as objective and fair and clear as possible. And yeah, sometimes it might move or be inconsistent, but that's that's just evolution, right? We, we learn. Probably the best example I can give is the the old uh, TRT use exemption for in the UFC, right? Where yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't allow steroids, but they did allow TRT therapy. And suddenly, like, every fighter in the UFC had a testosterone deficiency. <laughs> and they were able to close that loophole at some point. But, I mean, yeah, the rules were inconsistent there for a while. But the goal should really not be to come up with one perfect set of rules and leave it forever. It's more like constant vigilance and trying to always make sure that you've got the best and most fair playing field. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. That was well said. So let me ask you a question here. You've convinced me I'm, I am anti-drugs, anti-doping, never for Steve, which it honestly is easy for me to say because I'm, I'm a lazy fuck and I don't compete. But <laughs> that said, so if we want to clean up our sport, then I guess the question is, what do we do? Like, like, how do we do it? If we agree that PEDs are an issue, at least in some incarnation, or if we think that, you know, maybe they, there are certain situations where we, where they might be okay, or maybe they're not like, what sort of policy changes would we have to put in place to really make jujitsu like a clean sport, a sport where people can have trust that they're having on a level playing field when they compete? At least I think what we can gather from other sports is you, you're never going to be a hundred percent sure that it's, fully clean but we can do a lot better than <laughs> what we're doing now uh, and i think probably even just like so, so i mean to, to me um it would be random random testing you know let's let's say a competition like worlds or, or adcc worlds if, if they were to to want to try to get on top of it like find out who's 
going to be competing beforehand. Like, you know, the ADCC has invites. Maybe have the qualifier as a year out from the event and you've got one year or six months, whatever it is, until that event and random testing for those athletes that are that are selected. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How do you feel about the institutions that we have in place? Because, you know, something that I always wonder about yeah. is the, the power structure in our arts actually holding us back to some level. Because, I mean, you look at the IBJJF, right? They are basically kind of like a wing of Gracie Baja. And I, I'm not taking anything away from them. I mean, I've been on the podcast saying before that actually I'm a big fan of the IBJJS rules. And there's no question we would not have the competition scene and the growth rate that we do if not for the IBJJF. But at the end of the day, there's sort of a conflict of interest there, right? And I wonder, is it important to do in our art what other sports do, where they basically like divest the watchdog functions to an independent body? Well, I think that that, that should happen. Uh, I mean, but they're a private company, so is that a good use of their money? I mean, I think for the long-term benefit of the sport and for the image of the sport and so on, it absolutely would be. But is that is that what a private company wants to do with their money? Is that, you know, like, can they sustain? I mean, I, I, would, I think we can all agree that they've got enough worldwide exposure and competitors that they, they could afford to do random testing on the top black belt athletes. Absolutely. And to be fair, there is precedent for this, right? I mean, the best precedent I can think of is the UFC. Because I, if you recall, back in the 90s, I mean, the UFC, they were almost forced to close their doors because there were there were government officials. And in fact, I think John McCain was central in this, yep. in trying to ban and restrict the UFC. Because I remember, that at the time, they called it human cockfighting, which... To be fair, was kind of the UFC's fault because they marketed themselves as this kind of crazy blood sport, right? And one of the things that they had to do, despite being a private company, is they had to really push for regulation and independent oversight. And it is the fact that they did that, that they were able to actually grow into this very, very legitimate sport. And it's kind of crazy when you think about it, right? Like if you look back at UFC 1, it... Like, it literally is like a blood sport tournament. I mean, they were, I think Horian was even talking about having, like, alligators around yeah. the ring at some point. It was a, a total scene, right? Like, it was a total joke. And it's kind of crazy that through a concerted push, they were able to get themselves regulated, bring in independent testers. Like, they gave up a lot of control to become legitimate. And as a result, I mean, like even my parents, like they know what MMA is and they know it's a real sport and that would have been unheard of not that long ago. So there, there's a precedent that it can be done and there's a precedent that it does work. But like you said, like a private company has got to give up a lot of the levers of control if they want to take things to that level. And I don't know if these companies want to do that. Yeah, you know, one thing about the IBJJF as well is they're not really... Uh... They're pretty money oriented with their business model. I mean, anyone who who competes knows about all the payments and dues that you have to give the IBJJF every year, the hoops that you have to go through to just to get registered with them sometimes, um, especially if you're a new black belt. And I think for a company to go through the kind of, you know, validation that the UFC went to and becoming a mainstream sport, they, there has to be a desire by the company to become yeah that validated and 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 uh, change their image, and I think IBJJF honestly they just they they look at the at the balance on one end is money and on the other end is is you know the sport becoming more mainstream and more legitimate as a as a fair play sport, and I think they're just choosing to go with money instead and. and and I don't, I don't expect to see them do uh, random. I know they do random drug testing, but let's be honest: if you're not winning black belt worlds, you're probably not going to get drug tested, right? So I, ju- I just don't see them doing that. Yeah, but it's, it's not ran. It's not random. Um, they're not doing random timing. They're doing. I'm pretty sure they're just testing random winners of black belt. <laughs> to, you know, like if you win the worlds, you might get randomly tested on that day. But they're not actually like like what I would like to see is for myself you know like twice a year or three times a year i get a phone call like you got to be here within you know by tuesday we're going to you know like be where where are you on tuesday we're going to take a urine and blood sample like that's what i would like to see and like because the idea of that being i guess that because you don't know when it's going to happen you have to be you know some, someone who would want to cheat would never know when they're going to be tested so they have to basically be clean because mm-hmm. no, no when people know that they're going to be tested on the 
world podium after they win, they can prepare their, you know, their um drug use for that, I think. So Yeah. And there is there is so much politics involved in IBJJF, all the way from seeding the brackets to uh I've heard rumors of certain people have popped and then they kind of have the ability to quote retire or whatever and yeah i've heard that yeah i've 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 heard i've heard things people that you wouldn't expect to be on on steroids and some you would have tested positive and and because of who they know they're able to sort of save face in the public and quote retire rather than they're basically given a choice in this situation and i think other people aren't given that same choice it all depends how you know and uh, it, because of because the IBJJF is so political and there is a lot of uh, nepotism that goes on in there, I just don't know that you are going to get fair readings unless the IBJJF, you know, fully embraces that. OK, we want to legitimize this sport. It, there's going to be a zero tolerance policy. The, the punishments will be harsh. The testing will be random. Only then will I think we'll see actually a, a shift in the culture. But for now, it's kind of like a. You know, it's kind of hit or miss. And I think I think you could argue at least at the higher weight classes that most of these guys probably are on something in the IBJJF and ADCCs. Do either of you guys have kids or? Yeah, I got two kids. Let's say they were 19 years old and and wanted to get into, like, you know, they were, they were doing pretty well at jiu-jitsu and wanted to start taking it seriously. Like, would you be strongly encouraging of them to like go down the I want to be an elite competitor route right now like would that be a something would you be worried about the you know the pressures that would be put on them to you know take things that could affect their health or sorry I don't know if I understand the question if if they were 19 and they wanted to become serious competitors I would be all for that okay yeah yeah no would like I guess like are you would you be happy with the current culture or would you like you know I mean, it, it it is what it is. Uh, I think that's a different question from would I encourage the use of steroids? Is that is that kind of what you're is that what you're getting at? <laughs> yeah, I assume you wouldn't encourage that. Yeah, I mean, I would I would educate them. Ultimately, I think it's it is their choice if they're adults. But yeah, I would right. I would focus on on informing them of the ethical point of view, sort of how I went through my 20s and 30s competing and how at the end of the day, even though I kind of tinker with the idea of like, man, it would be awesome to just get <laughs> get a little bit of help during my training. I, I do I do agree with you that ethically, you know, I, that's the reason why I've never done it. Because, because in the back of my mind, I know that if I, you know, let I didn't know how far I was going to go in jujitsu when I was 20. Uh, and I thought, OK, well, you know, what if I win like a big tournament or I, I do really well? But it, but the whole time I've been on juice and then I, you know, maybe I have to stop one day. And then I just the, the idea of what I would feel like when I came off the sauce, I feel like that would be really depressing if I because then I, everything would, I've ever accomplished would be in question. Yeah, I would be like, OK, did I actually? And that assumes no one finds out, right? It's a totally different situation. If it, if it does get found out, then you have a totally different set of problems that are even worse. Right. And and I feel like, you know, it, when it comes time to have that chat with my kids, I mean, I, I'm hoping that they want to commit their lives to jujitsu, obviously. Uh, I can't force them to do anything, but like if they wanted to to take over the gym or whatever one day and they wanted to compete, like nothing would make me happier. Whatever makes them happy. But I would I would make sure that they understand I think it's such a positive thing to to like train jujitsu and compete and so on. And I just feel like that's I heard recently someone telling me actually since the since I made that post I had someone message me about, you know, their their friend that's 19 that was, you know, asking them whether they should or should, you know, trying to take it seriously, but whether they should or shouldn't be taking drugs. And I'm thinking, geez, that's, that's, that's such a shame that that happens, you know? Um, yeah. Getting that extra boost, it could, it could put you into the upper echelon if you're really good. And it could be what separates you from the best of the best. But at the same time, it's like in the back of your mind, you know that you, you cheated and you know that you know, if you're, if you're really hitting the sauce hard, I mean, this, who knows the ramifications that this has on your body long term, right? Like, yeah. even when I think about uh, one day, maybe, maybe help, getting some help and doing some, some steroids or TRT or whatever, I've always thought about, you know, like small, small doses. I think a lot of people kind of do it because they want to get bigger, they want to get stronger. Like, I've, <laughs> I've only literally, whenever I think about it, I only want to, just 
feel recovered and feel like I can train hard, but not like I, I actually want to be smaller than I am, <laughs> which is such a weird thing for jujitsu <laughs> fighters. It's like, I, I wish I was the weight class below. I would love, I would love to be feather, but I just can't make it. Lightweight's the hardest division, right? <laughs> like I, I'm like too big for, for, uh, to make feather, but I'm too small to be a lightweight. And most of the featherweights are taller than me. So it's like, fucked. It's got this like small stumpy body. Um, but I, I never wanted to like, you know, Oh, I'm going to get huge. That's kind of my goal. I need to be a lot stronger or whatever. I just like, I just want to recover. I just want, uh, I want to be able to train hard into my forties and fifties. And, uh, you know, injuries are becoming more common for me now. And it's like, it's, it's just, it's kind of part of the journey, I think. So Mm -hmm. I would always think to myself, man, everything I earned, did I earn it because I was on steroids or, you know, was it real? Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of that conversation we had with Robert Deagle, where he was talking about how there's a certain type of winning that he would not be satisfied with. There's a quality to how you win as well. And at the end of the day, he mentioned that for him, winning is not enough. He wants to win under his own conditions and under his own principles and doing the type of jujitsu that he wants to do. And I I think that matters, right? I mean, if you do take uh, performance enhancing drugs or cheat in any way and you win, there's always that question mark next to you, right? You can never really actually say for sure that you actually won. And that's not even getting into what can happen to you if you're caught, right? Yeah. That's another matter altogether. That's, that can be a career killer right there. And I mean, you know, to your point, I would love it if my daughter trained jujitsu, but if she came to me one day and said, dad, I need to get on something, right? If I want to compete at the next level, I would totally not co-sign on that, you know, yeah. because the whole reason I love jujitsu is because it is a vehicle for improvement. I mean, my instructor always said that his goal was to get his students to black belt without them getting seriously hurt because wellness is such a key part of jujitsu, right? You can fight at a very high level without really risking serious injury a lot of the time. And if my daughter were getting into jujitsu and felt the pressure to do something that could harm her health in the long term, that's not jujitsu to me. That's something else. And that's not the reason why I would want people to train this art. Absolutely. I actually really like what you said about how your instructor said, I want to get you to black belt without a major injury. That's actually <laughs> amazing. I, I never even thought of how awesome that is. I'm totally going to adopt that as a, as an instructor. It's like literally the most important thing when, when you, when you're 20, yeah. right? It's like, I want to learn to be a, a street fighter badass. And when you're 30 or 25 or whatever, it's, I want to be a world champion. But by, the, but by the time you're getting to 40, it's look, I just, I just want to survive today. I just don't, I don't want to be limping tomorrow. Dude, I'm thinking that now. <laughs> Every day I go into class, I'm like, okay, here we go. (laughs) Fuck, I hope I don't get her today. (laughs) It's funny, too, because I remember watching you spar when you were like 20-something, Matt, and you'd be in there like in the absolutes with a guy like 150 pounds heavier than you, and you would just shoot a straight double on him, and he would just sprawl (laughs) on your head. And I was like, this fucker's dead. (laughs) I had no strategy whatsoever, like. Back, awesome. back in my 20s, there were days when I would do like literally every tournament I would do locally, mind you, I would do four divisions. I would do gi and no gi and then I would do gi absolute, no gi absolute every time. And then sometimes I'd even go and play a hockey game after. <laughs> and, and now I'm like, holy shit, like I don't know how many, you know, how many miles I took off my tires there. Uh, now, now I do like uh, a three hour session and I'm I'm pretty wiped, you know. But it's tempting to, you know, you look at some of these athletes, some of the best in the world, you know, they're training like two, three times a day going hard. And it's it is seductive to want to do that. But it's it is it's it's a moral dilemma, right? Like you you want to reach your potential. You want to get in there and do your best. But at the end of the day, what is it worth if it's you know, if if you're cheating? I mean, that's a real thing. You can say you can say all you want, like. Like, uh, you know, some people, oh, well, you could have never, you could never do that without steroids. Oh, Lachlan could have never gotten bronze at 80 CC absolute without steroids. It's like, yeah, but you're kind of, you're kind of projecting your own insecurities and making such a statement. At least that's, that's sort of how I feel when I hear stuff like that is it's like, well, how, how can you say that? How can you say that somebody's achievement is literally because he is on steroids? Like, look, look how you did in the absolute bronze division. 
or sorry, the absolute division when you got bronze, you heel hooked everyone. It's not like that was because you were on steroids. Well, it's quite clear my opponents were stronger than me. <laughs> anyway, um, like no, no amount of increased strength would have really helped me there. Yeah, they're they're all stronger than you, and I'm pretty sure Gaudio, Kainen, and and Ali, like. Let's be honest, they're, they're probably, you know, you don't have to comment on it, but I know Ali has uh, admitted that he's he's done steroids before. These guys are huge, right? Probably yeah. probably have done steroids. And you go in there, you're much smaller. Like, you're my size, maybe a bit bigger, and you heel hook them all. It's like, it's not like you outstrengthed any of them. No. You went in there and, and you had a game plan and uh, you funneled your game plan to a strategy where they just weren't equipped to... Uh, have the right responses and they had to tap out it's it's not like you went in there and out muscled them and out cardioed them you were just you you know you had your system or whatever so uh, to say that oh somebody got this achievement because he he had to be on juice you know it's like well now you're just projecting your own insecurities now yeah. to me it it says to me that that person doesn't think that they could do it if they weren't on steroids yeah i think um i mean because obviously my post didn't uh, I didn't say any names. It was a general comment on my my thoughts <laughs> about it, and um, I think for a certain someone that that um, that ruined their world view that you know everyone's on it, and you know I can't be cheating because everyone's on it, and you know you destroyed him so bad that he fled the country. <laughs> <laughs> for someone to say yeah. otherwise, he just couldn't. He couldn't. Um, Except that. So, yeah, he yeah. Certain, well, certainly. Well, well, I think Matt had a good point too, which is that projection comes into play, right? I mean, I, yeah, I remember reading a great quote from, I think, Dan Gable, where he was asked about his opponents on steroids. And he said, I would love it mm. if my opponents were on steroids because I know that means they don't think they can do it. They need, yeah. they think they need help, right? I, I would love them to be on steroids because it means they've already lost the mental game. And that's a, a really, I mean, obviously, at the end of the world, we would just rather have a level playing field and have to think about things that way. But it's a really cool mindset. And I do think that Matt's got a point that I, a lot of this is probably projection, right? And uh, unfortunately, that that is what it is. But, I, you know, something I wanted to ask you, and you brought this up, I, you've done a, a really careful job, I know, of not pointing any fingers. And that's something that I think is awesome because we do kind of live in a day and age where, especially in 2020, you know, everyone's kind of on a hair trigger anyway, but it's so easy to point fingers and lay blame at people. And I, I would ask you, you know, do you think that even really helps like trying, trying to out the cheaters? Cause I know there was that, that like anonymous account that was trying to prove yeah. people in BJJ do steroids. Like is, is any of this helpful or is it actually just driving a wedge in the community that's going to make it harder to heal. I'd be curious to get your thoughts on that. I I mean, I just, regardless, like, I mean... It I, was you, wasn't it, Lachlan? <laughs> <laughs> it was you filming autos. <laughs> you got me. Nah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I really think, like, there's no... The only way to prove it really is, is a positive test. So until i i kind of just believe in the in innocent until proven guilty and i think it's it's um very detrimental to try to accuse but especially by looking at i mean hilarious the you know taking pictures of me after a weight cut and then which i've basically been like 78 kilos. i've looked exactly this like pretty much the same body yeah for the last 15 years and then you know taking a weight cut with my shirt on not warmed up or anything compared to right after a competition and, and trying to make it and saying it's claiming that I've put on <laughs> claiming that I've put on twenty pounds, which is completely untrue. I've only ever really cut weight. Otherwise I, I just revert back to my my seventy eight, seventy nine kilos. I actually wanted to I tried to eat a lot. I tried to get up to I wanted to eat so much that I could get up to like eighty three for eighty CC and then cut down and I I, I think the highest I got was seventy nine. Like mm -hmm. basically my my body just when I'm training it just sits at that flat point. But but I think it's I think like looking at people's photos. Uh, obviously, I mean there's some people who you're like okay they've gone through a extreme transformation. We can be <laughs> yep. suspect, but I still don't think publicly you should say it until until they actually test positive. And then and then I think like once they have like go for it. And I think that should be should be harsh. And I think we should test a lot more um, so we can actually try and find those people. But yeah, I, I don't think it's a, a beneficial thing to speculate. Yeah, and that picture with you without a shirt, I mean, 
you you look jacked but like you don't look 3d jacked you know you don't look like the hulk or like your your muscles <laughs> yeah. are like out of control round boulders it's just you look like you're in good shape so for me when i saw that i was like i don't really think he's like i don't get that steroid vibe you know and then and you look at guys like tonin you know like one of my favorite grapplers i mean you see him without his shirt like he doesn't look like he's on juice either he's not like bulging out of control I fought quite a few people in my weight division, and I really haven't got an impression <laughs> that they are. But I mean, I, mm. I again, that's just like I don't even know what, like as in, like I haven't been like, whoa, you know, like yeah. this is overwhelming or totally different to anyone I roll at the gym. I mean, they're they're obviously technically very proficient, but um, and it's worth noting too that vascularity and and musculature are not the best way to assess whether someone's on a performance enhancing drug. Like look at the Mayow brothers, they popped, right? And they're, they're very slender. Well, you got to remember too, like we're talking about world-class athletes here. If they're doing their job, they will get in shape and ideally get bigger as they, you know, continue to work out. You would, especially as you age, like you're, you're going to be dealing with people who are in physically great shape. So just looking at a photo, I think is not great evidence. I mean, there are cases where, like if someone puts on like 60 pounds of solid muscle in a year, <laughs> okay, may, maybe then we can start waving the flag that, okay, something is off with this. But but generally speaking, physique is not in itself. Like, I mean, it, it's just a witch hunt if you're just looking at someone's physique and making arguments. I mean, I remember when Tim Sylvia, of all people, popped for steroids <laughs> in the yeah, UFC. Yeah. That is the last guy you would think would be on steroids. But you can't rely on how someone looks when it comes to steroids, right? Steroids yeah. are not just for bodybuilders. They... Um, they don't necessarily just make you look like, you know, you're perfectly sculpted. That's not necessarily the best way to to tell. And I definitely think that if you believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, you should definitely not be accusing someone of being on on the bomba just because they look jacked, right? Let's be honest. I mean, I think I'm in lightweight division, which I think is the toughest division out there. <laughs> in it, I, If I could, like, you know, if I could put on like naturally put on size, I'd be trying to get away from that division <laughs> trying to fight the bigger guys <laughs> yeah yeah if I, if I like could could naturally like build myself up to being like an 88 kilo guy which obviously i don't think that would be possible without um without some enhancement that would be um that would be a i, th I think that division's much um much nicer i have to say lachlan if you if it really is the case that your strategy is to get loaded up on the sauce. You have the worst strategy ever because you're in there. You're in there with guys that have got to outweigh you by like a hundred pounds. I yeah, mean, that's right. when I'm watching some of those matches, I'm like, it's, it's interesting to watch because it's like, you're there and then this guy sits on you and you get folded up like an accordion. And I can't even see you anymore under these guys. <laughs> and then I see like one little foot peek out and then I see K guard and then you heel hook him. And I, I have absolutely no idea what just happened. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that people throw around these accusations very fast and furious, especially maybe when they feel defensive for reasons yeah. that, you know, because I, everyone, I mean, this is, this is people's lives. It's their careers. I can understand the sensitivity, but I mean, if, if there's one thing that I would hope we have learned in this crazy year, it's that like throwing around accusations and causing divisions is just going to put a wedge between people. And if, if we want to clean up the sport, I think that, like you said, there has to be a burden of proof. And to get there, that means we have to have testing. Yeah, I agree. Well, Lachlan, thank you again so much for spending time with us. This was an awesome chat and something that we, I know Matt and I have wanted to do for some time. Any closing thoughts or, or notes that you want to share before we tie this one up? Yeah, I suppose if I can just say to people like you can you can make it without PEDs, so don't feel pressured to do it. You can, you know, think about long term improvement. Um, things don't have to be immediate. I've been training for eighteen years. It took me sixteen, seventeen years to finally get a medal at ADCC, which was amazing. And obviously even then I didn't really expect that to happen. But um, you know, just be consistent, improvement happens focus on like having a, a good consistent training volume and you don't have to to cheat to to get there awesome well well thank you so much um anything you want to plug i know you've been super active on instagram now that you guys are back in the gym any content coming up that our listeners should know about um so i've obviously the second part of the guard retention anthology has been released so you can get them as a together as a bundle now so there's around and under the legs and then through the legs 
really, I mean, for me, that made a huge difference in my, in my game. Just in work, working with Ari, who, who, who was a kind of a collaboration instructional, kind of presented a full spectrum of, of guard retention. No matter what style someone's trying to pass, you should have an answer from, from that. And then the logical follow-up, which I'm working on now, is uh, I'm going to do something on on open guard. I've, I've already started filming that. So open guard, outside leg positioning. So going to be a lot of K guard, De La Hiva, waiter, um, leg entanglements, and, and even a bit of kind of 50-50, some slightly different stuff. So I suppose it'll be kind of a, a link between, I've got the leg lock anthology and the guard retention, and it's going to be kind of the offensive guard which can lead to leg locks or to sweeps or to the back um so yeah that should be i imagine that's a few months away before it's actually out but yeah got it well hey the the dual set out just in time for christmas from one of the best in the game lachlan thank you again so much for all of your time i everyone loves it when you're here uh so say hi to live for us i hope this episode doesn't get us in too much trouble <laughs> but i think we run our, our best behavior here i think we. Were i mean if it reasonable. does it's kind of cool too any exposure is good right so that's right <laughs> <laughs> i am totally okay with the internet hating me i mean if that gets more views to the podcast that's that's good for me so yeah for those who want to support us or continue to support us you know how to do it patreon.com slash bjj mental models Best way to support the show, help us keep the lights on, help us get through the next 100 episodes. It is the patrons who are the heroes that allow us to do what we do. Thank you again so much to all of you. And again, if you want to support us, patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Lachlan, have a great day, buddy. Thank you again so much for coming by and sharing your insights with us. Thank you again. Say hi to the family. Glad you guys are back to training. And to all of the listeners, talk to you guys next time. See you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, guys. That was great. 